Hi, my name is Stefan Burns, and I'm a senior geophysicist with Geometrics. And today we're in the Humboldt Range. I'm with the University of Nevada, Reno, and we're doing geophysical geothermal investigations using UAV magnetometry techniques. Familiar geothermal systems would be those associated with visible phenomena like hot springs and geysers. These can be found in Yellowstone, Iceland, and elsewhere around the world. But our search was for a blind geothermal system with no surface expression. This high temperature fluid flow is hidden deep underground but has the potential for geothermal renewable energy. A variety of geoscientists have contributed to this geothermal exploration project. From field work to final results, catch an inside glimpse into a university-led UAV magnetics operation and learn about the faulting and geothermal systems in Nevada in the process. First, we turn to James Faulds, the Nevada State Geologist, for some geologic background on the field site. We know that geothermal systems, the known systems in Nevada that are hot enough to, let's say, produce electricity, occur in certain types of what we call favorable structural settings. What that really just means is that there are certain kinds of fault patterns that are favorable for geothermal activity uh, versus others. And this particular pattern that we have in this area uh, actually hosts about one third of the known geothermal systems uh, in Nevada, or in the, actually the whole Great Basin region. And, and so what we have here is what we call a step over. So there's one big fault, kind of like this, another big fault like that. And one is ending in one direction, the other ending in the other direction. So we're right in really the, yeah, the middle of the step over. So uh, there's a big fault behind us on the range front okay, where it pops up there. And then there's a big fault uh, on the other side of us, like where I'm kind of looking toward, where there's the other part of the range. Uh, and that part of the range is kind of ending in this area as that fault ends. A key feature would be a low magnetic anomaly that, that uh, is, let's say, maybe sort of circular in shape or semi-circular or maybe ellipsoidal in shape, uh, something like that. If we have a long linear low magnetic magnetic anomaly that could just be the rocks <clears throat> that happen to be low in magnetism. But when you have more of a circular anomaly, something like that, that's an indication that the rocks could be altered. So maybe you've altered magnetite to hematite, there's lower magnetic susceptibility um, <clears throat> and therefore low, lower magnetic values. And, and that's what we're looking for. Not all systems will show up in that way, but uh, many of them do. And, and that's why it's a great place then to record uh, geophysical data because uh, the geophysical data might give us a clue that there is, is or is not uh, uh, geothermal fluids uh, beneath us. The duo leading the UAV mag field work were Chris Kratt and Dr. Rachel Hachibara. Chris piloted the UAV and we'll hear from him shortly, but first I spoke with Rachel about flight engineering for UAV magnetics. Doing, doing some UAV mag these first couple months, uh, getting to know the system a little bit more. Uh, I had never flown a drone or worked with magnetics uh, prior to my studies uh, with, with this postdoc, but um, uh, my uh, background is actually in uh, observational seismology, so I'm getting back to the geophysics. With UAV and mag, I'm, I'm diving into some different modeling for magnetics, but I'm out here flying the drone half the time and collecting the data in, in this awesome environment. And so I'm really getting uh, my, my feet a little dirty. Uh, flying a drone, it never, never gets old. Um, and while I do most of the flight engineering and, and uh, making sure we're flying the right flight path, uh, watching it take off and land is, is still pretty epic. With the UGCS software, uh, Chris has taught me a lot. Uh, it's really user-friendly and uh, intuitive. The things you, you would think a flight needs, it, it's right there. Um, and as long as you know what to check uh, in terms of the parameters, making sure you're, you're flying safely, you, you have um, those safeguards in place before you take off, um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty user friendly for, for software um, that, you know, flies a drone out there. So a lot of the factors um, that go into making the, the flight paths are the topography of the area. What kind of area are we in? We've flown in more residential area. and 
those cases, we have to make sure to watch out to not fly over anyone's house. In this case, it's, uh, it's all just uh, topography, um, but we have to make sure that the drone can climb uh, and we have enough uh, buffer that we can see it um, and it's not gonna get too high on a mountain and, and just crash. Uh, we also have to make sure our at home, our, our emergency at home, gets high enough above the terrain. So these are the things we're, we're thinking about when we're making the flight path. We also have to consider uh, the direction we're flying, um, making sure we're trying to stay consistent with that. And the best the best part about um, kind of uh, flying it and making the paths is that when you can get it set up so your blocks are right next to each other, so you're just sitting there all day kind of flying both blocks. Um, yeah, making it the most efficient runs possible. In total, we flew 50 line kilometers for this geothermal exploration project. After the field work was done and the data was processed, I called Chris Kratt and Connor Smith for more information about UAV MAG and also for a first look at the results of the survey. It's not an exaggeration to say that uh, UAV magnetic survey surveying is um, hugely innovative uh, for geophysics exploration. Um, and the major innovation is uh, just cost effectiveness. You can um, cover much more ground than you can uh, with a ground magnetic survey, um, you know, flying it with the drone, similar to an airborne survey, but not nearly as expensive as a piloted airborne survey. And so for example, uh, a, a strong ground operator can cover 15 to 20 line kilometers per day on low relief terrain. Um, a UAV magnetic survey um, in that same amount of time one day can cover at least 100 line kilometers um, per day and perhaps uh, far more than that with some of the new UAV uh, gas hybrid um, systems that are out there. And uh, UAV magnetic surveying has a couple other advantages. You uh, mitigate risk to individual ground operators that, um, uh, that traditionally oftentimes work in remote um, and inhospitable terrain. So uh, it creates an improvement in safety. And another advantage is that uh, you can fly other sensors um, on the UAV at the same time you're flying the magnetic sensor. So uh, a lot of um, people like having uh, videography or just um, uh, over uh, structure for motion missions can also be done uh, or have the potential to be done in coordination with UAV magnetic surveys. Wow, so you can have multiple sensors uh, as payloads on your drone and you can cover seven to 10 times, potentially 15 times more ground than a backpack mag with the UAV mag survey. Uh, but there's probably a little bit more skill involved. Uh, if you just have a backpack, it's fairly easy to just walk around. What are some of the tools and software that you use to uh, effectively leverage the strength of UAV magnetics? Yeah, there, there's definitely um, a learning curve uh, to get into it. There is more risk involved in terms of um, potential uh, damage to your equipment if you make a mission planning error and, and fly into something, be it trees uh, or terrain. But um, one of the ways we help uh, make our mission successful is we like working with um, Universal Ground Con Control Station software for, for mission planning and execution. So UGCS has some nice features that it allows you to import high resolution elevation data um, to improve your terrain following ability and fly closer to the ground um, with more confidence. So uh, perhaps as, you know, as close as a meter to the ground to, to get data that's comparable to a ground magnetic survey, but oftentimes, you know, 10 meters above ground level or even 30 to 50 meters above ground level uh, is totally suitable for um, many uh, geologic problems and uh, geophysical exploration applications. Uh, yeah, UGCS is great. Chris, you're a rare breed in being able to fly the drone and also process the data. But as I understand it for this project, Connor, you were the one that did the data processing for this really large block of mag data that was collected. 
Can you talk a little bit about the general workflow uh, that you did to process this data and what the deliverables were? Uh, yeah, um, so uh, our workflow basically starts with taking the raw total magnetic intensity data um, and doing processing using uh, GeoSoft Oasis Montage software. Um, and then our first step is, is uh, using our base station data to apply a diurnal correction uh, to account for changes in the Earth's magnetic field that occur throughout the day. Um, and then from there, we have uh, we edit the diurnally corrected data to exclude anything that's not uh, part of the survey line, uh, including takeoffs and landing segments. Mm. Um, and then after we grid our data and apply a reduction to pole, which accounts for the inclination of the Earth's field at our latitude. Uh, and then when we have this reduced data, we can start making interpretations um, and constraints with other uh, geologic and geophysical data sets. Um, and then kind of as a last step, we could take this uh, reduced to pole data and calculate um, the horizontal gradient, first vertical derivative and analytical signal, each of which are really helpful maps uh, for making ob observations. And the UAV mag could actually find that specific target potentially, if it exists, it's, it has the resolution, the capability of doing that. Yeah, that's really exciting for, for geothermal exploration. Great, well, yeah, it was uh, excellent doing that project and be able to work with both of you out in the field to collect this data. And uh, Connor, while we have you, I understand that you've done a lot of the data processing already. Can you share with us some of these key insights that you found from the data that we collected? This is a zoomed out view of our study area. Um, and just wanted to talk briefly about um, the background to this area. So this is a large step over in the Humboldt range, uh, which is a common structure uh, for hosting geothermal systems. And often step overs are associated with a high fault fracture density and increased permeability, which can provide pathways for hydrothermal fluid flow at depth. Um, and so, yeah, we're showing black lines here, uh, which are representing a fault that runs all along the foot of the Humboldt range and this relay ramp of the step over. The age of this fault is also a big factor in why it was selected. It's a young Holocene age rupture. And if I toggle the Google Earth view, you can kind of make out where there's a scarp along this fault. So this site was chosen as part of a regional exploration study known as the Play Fairway Analysis. And part of that study was to do some um, reconnaissance work by taking two meter shallow temperature uh, measurements this is a, a relatively cheap and efficient way to start off geothermal exploration uh, efforts. And so shown here are uh, measurements from a two meter temperature probe survey. Um, and these range from about 18 degrees C and cooler colors of blue up to around 26 degrees C, some of these warmer colors. And so our goal is basically to, to design our mag survey to cover um, where these shallow anomalies might be, and they may represent um, areas where you could have hydrothermal fluid flow that's uh, not manifesting at the surface uh, because of these permeable alluvial sediments in the basin. And so where you have some thermal anomalies uh, might represent where there's structure accommodating fluid flow or outflow of hydrothermal fluids in the basin. Here we have a view of the horizontal magnetic gradient map and this is especially useful for helping resolve subsurface structures that have little manifestation, some that might represent some pathways for geothermal fluid flow, and especially um, certain faults that are within this basin. And so this data is really helpful for delineating where these areas might be. And if I turn this map off, you'll see that there's little evidence of faulting within the basin, but using this data, we've inferred the locations of multiple faults that fall within the basin and along the relay ramp of our step over. Um, just to toggle, you can see how this data is especially useful for picking out where these structures might be. And you see some alignment with the topography here, but in the ba basin, uh, we wouldn't be able to determine where these structures are without our horizontal magnetic gradient. Okay, here we are looking at the total magnetic intensity data, diurnally corrected and reduced to pole. 
And one of the first things we notice um, is this magnetic low here. It uh, is right um, along this big fault. So these are the types of things that we hope to elucidate under the basin fill um, where there's low topographic relief. And this could be a result of the juxtaposition of high magnetic susceptibility uh, rocks against lower magnetic susceptibility rocks and thus reveals um, where the structures are. Um, it's possible uh, that it could be related to the destruction of magnetite from hydrothermal alteration uh, from geothermal fluids, you know, upwelling along the structure. That's a possibility. We would certainly hope that. Um, another interesting thing to note here is this little jog in this fault, and that could be caused by some uh, lateral offset along the range bounding fault here. That's the Holocene fault. But let's um, let's zoom out and take a broader look at that entire data set. And I'll show you, uh, here are the flight lines that we flew. This is a hundred meter spacing between lines. And there's uh, about 50 line kilometers of data there. So I'm gonna go back to the um, total magnetic intensity data. Again, there's that low, uh, we wanna trace that stuff out into the basin. And when we expand this survey, um, these, are, these are the types of things that we hope to reveal these high short wavelength total magnetic intensity data here these are just shallow features so maybe some layers of uh, thin layers of mafic rocks uh, in these hills here that are buried in here um, short spatial wavelength and so thus this stuff is is high up in the crust and eventually we'll filter that out so we can reveal what the deeper structural controls are uh, maybe something else to note right here is this uh, magnetic high. Uh, and, you know, maybe that's because this canyon is dumping out um, more mafic rocks on the fan, and that's what we're seeing here. But when I looked at this more closely, um, I'll turn this off. I noticed a drainage lineament right here, pretty straight, comes down here, and then it bends and comes along here in kind of a rectilinear um, pattern. You know, so maybe uh, what we're seeing here is a buried structural block, and uh, this is the this is possibly the fault bound edge of that block. That's a possible interpretation, but we'll um, expand this survey to the north and south, and we'll get a better understanding of the again of the deeper structural controls. Lastly, we return back to James Faults for more information on geothermal systems and the potential for geothermal energy to transform our energy grid. In Nevada, a place like Nevada, you go a mile beneath the surface. It's hot everywhere, but there's only special locations uh, associated with these favorable fault patterns where you actually had a lot of fluid flowing through that rock. You're utilizing hot water, okay? hot water flowing through rocks at depth. Nevada, uh, we know, has more geothermal resources than any other state. Um, it, the, the, the secret, though, is finding where these blind resources are. <clears throat> but geothermal energy is an amazing form of renewable energy. It has a low carbon footprint. It has a low footprint in terms of once you do develop an area in terms of the land that's needed uh, 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 for the development. Uh, and it, it's 24-7. Okay, so once you uh, understand the system and you start producing from it, and if you manage it well, it produces 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's important to have that steady 24-7 uh, dependable power supply. The geothermal uh, reservoirs they are typically uh, a kilometer or two kilometers beneath the surface, so uh, a half mile to uh, a mile or a mile and a half beneath the surface. And so we're bringing up hot, uh, sort of briny fluids, okay, that wouldn't be good for drinking water or agriculture or anything like that. Um, and of course, you want to case the well. So when you bring those fluids up, that there, none of those briny fluids get into your shallow aquifers that maybe you might be using for drinking water or um, um, agriculture. And then you, you know, utilize that water, the heat in it, and then you want to re-inject those waters so that you keep your system recharged, okay, basically recharge your system. And so you put the you put the same water that you took out back into the earth, okay, in a well that's also cased. So there, 
you don't you don't want to lose those fluids. Okay, so it behooves a geothermal plant to be very um, careful about the well integrity and the, the casing of those wells because you need that fluid to keep circulating to basically drive your power plant. It's, it can be a little tricky reinjection. You reinject too close, you'll cool your system down. You reinject too far away, okay, you won't recharge your system. So there's an intricate balance there um, that can, can take some. Um, um, you know, uh, fairly detailed uh, analyses and so on. But in this day and age, as UAV magnetometry, uh, things like that are advancing, we now do 3D models, geothermal systems and so on, to really try to understand the subsurface. So this could be huge, the UAV magnetometry, and helping us to be a lot more um, economic and efficient, and we could cover many more areas. Oh, it's, there, it's fantastic. If this is where I'm coming to work, you know, once every couple weeks, I'm, I'm a happy camper. This video was created in partnership with Geometrics, the University of Nevada, Reno, CTEMPS, and UGCS. I've been your host, Stefan Burns. Thanks for watching.